Welcome to the Exhibit A podcast. Our guest today is Holly Freeling. Holly is a licensed marriage and family therapist, registered clinical art therapist, and certified EMDR therapist practicing in Pasadena. Enjoy Don and Holly's great discussion of her work in peak performance and family therapy. May I present Exhibit A? Three, two, one, we are on. Holly, how are you? Good. How are you, Don? Good, good. So we've been trying to arrange this for about a year. I think that the last time we were talking about this was right before the first lockdown. Yeah, right, we had right? it scheduled right before then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, look what's happened over the past year. Now we're all on Zoom and we're able to do these things. It shows you how, I guess, uh, resilient humans are. We always figure a way out. I think, you know, most of us kind of need a little bit of that push, don't we, to, to do those things that we should be doing anyway. We yeah. should all know how to do Zoom, but yeah, so it's been good in that way, I think. I think the technology was clearly available uh, way before the first lockdown. I know that, you know, we had teams, we weren't using it. I never knew that you could do the things that we do with it. I think most people were like that. So, <laughs> cool. So uh, today um, I wanted to talk to you. You do so many different things. You do uh, marriage family therapy. Uh, you're a, a regular guest on radio shows. You do art therapy. Uh, we can't cover it all today, and so I'm going to probably beg and, and ask you to come back on multiple occasions so we talk about all the things that you do. Uh, one of the things that I do want to talk about with you today is uh, your work in peak performance therapy. Is that what it's called, peak performance therapy? That's what I call it. But okay. yeah, I, to me, I, I just I'm one of these self-help people. I always want to, uh, you know, improve. You know, I think most people that uh, are in business or people that are succeeding want to always see what can I do more. And so when I saw that on your website, I thought, oh, my gosh, I, I really love to get you on the show to talk about that. How long have you been doing it? Um, 18 years. Something wow. like that. Yeah. Wow. So um, obviously you do more than that. You do marriage and family therapy, but peak performance would seem to me to be uh, really fun because you got people that are coming in that want to work with you, I would think. You know, they're not fighting it. Exactly. It's one of the reasons I love it. It's positive. It's solution focused. It's not about, oh, I feel terrible and, you know, make the, make the pain go away, which, you know, that's important too. I do that kind of therapy too, but I'm really into an action oriented therapy. What are you going to do about that? How, how are you going to, you know, can you fix it? If you can, why would you not try? Unless of course the price tag of the, of the cure is worse than the disease, but, but a lot of, there's so many things you can do to be more efficient. Like when you're saying I do all these different things and part of it is because I'm very efficient and driven and motivated and, I know how to manage my time and get all kinds of things done. And so, but I find that to be exciting. So, so, so maybe I've got the wrong idea of what type of client comes to you. Uh, maybe you could describe what that is. Cause I, I was thinking like CEOs or people like myself, you know, I'm a trial attorney and I come to you and I say, Holly, I'm pretty good at trial. In fact, I'm really good in trial, but I want to be the best, you know, and I don't feel like I'm maximizing my potential. Is that, the type of person you're seeing or, or is it a mixture of folks or what? Who, who are you, who's coming to see, seek your help? Well, I have a lot of those, those folks, very high end, very productive, um, successful clientele who come to me saying, okay, um, I've heard about your work and I want to do better. Um, or, or I'm so busy and I'm spinning all the time because I can't get everything done and that makes me anxious. So they're really successful, but they want to be better. And you can also use some of the tools too, if you have ADD or ADHD, where you can't really get yourself together um, or because no one's ever taught you. Like so many relationship skills and productivity skills and organizational skills, no one's ever taught you. We learn reading and we learn math in our country and we learn some science and you know very little of some of the other like life skills. So this is, it's great for that where you can say, hey, you know, this is just about me being better. So how did, how did you acquire the background to be able to give this type of therapy? Uh -huh. That's a good question. Um, it's funny because I always say, you know, some of these um, shows about organization or whatever, I'm like, those are people who that's their nature. Those people don't need the need the book. They don't need they don't need the help. They know how to do it. It's their nature. And I don't need to learn from somebody who it's their nature. I want to learn from somebody who doesn't who it wasn't their nature and they learned how to do it. 
And I think some of, there's a big hole missing in that. So I'm actually writing some books right now about it too, but is um, there's a big hole in that. So, you know, how do you learn how to do it? So I just started digging. This is my, na my nature. I'm like, I'm gonna dig, 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 dig and figure, okay, what is, you know, what works here? What works there? Trying it with my clients. Um, you know, from many different sources. So I have a whole protocol, tons and tons of stuff. Do you consider it therapy uh, per se, like you were trained in school and all your experience when you're dealing with people like, you know, with uh, depression or is it a different type of, a, of approach? Well, that's a good question. And I, I mean, certainly if you have issues with depression or anxiety or mental illness, you're, you're going to need to go to a licensed therapist. But I do do a lot of coaching because be, I have clients everywhere, many different countries and all over the place. So I kind of have two sort of arms to it. But, you know, of course, a lot of times this brings up a lot of emotions too, of feeling inadequate or having imposter syndrome or feeling really anxious because you know you're capable of it, but you're just not hitting the mark. So a lot of times it can be a combination of things, but sure, I have some people who, you know, emotionally they're fine and, you know, they're, you know, CEOs and scientists and entrepreneurs and all kinds of people. So it just depends on what they need. Yeah. When I think of uh, the imposter thing that you just talked about, you know, uh -huh. I think a lot of us feel that way. Um, you know, you never, uh, a lot of us, at least, you know, you succeed at something, but you wonder, you know, was that just luck, you know, and, and could you talk a little bit about that? What what causes people to have that? Well, that is, that is a mental thing, isn't it? A feeling, you know, that you, you aren't going to measure up. And frankly, I think part of it is um, evolution, that I think that in our particular culture, we, you know, we used to live in villages, right? Like way, you know, 100,000 years ago or 200,000 years ago. My people used to live in caves. But go ahead. Awesome. Caves, villages. Yeah. So you had this small group of people and everybody kind of had a role. Everybody had a place. You know, this one's the best thrower and this one's the best with horses and this one delivers babies. This one cooks and everybody kind of had their place. And then little by little, then we had radio, then we had TV and you're watching like these amazing newscasters and Academy Award winning actors. And now with internet and social media, you're kind of in your mind, you can't help it. You're comparing yourself with supermodels and Nobel laureates and Olympic athletes and so on and so forth. So the best in every single field. So of course you're gonna have some feelings of, I don't know, am I as good as I think I am? That's part of it. I think the other part too, and this is something that um, I, I'm obviously very bubbly and pretty positive, but at the same time, very realistic. And you know, I think everybody wants the softer, easier way. We want the easy way out. Just give me the hack, give me the pill. I wanna do something once. And that's just not how it works. Sometimes you just have to accept the fact that part of life is hard work. And you need to get on with the business of figuring out how you're gonna manage that and just get over this idea that you're gonna like get over the hump. Sort of like if you work out once when you're 20, and then you're upset that you're not buff when you're 50. I worked out once when I was 20. I, why in the world am I not buff now? Because you have to keep at it. So that can be another thing too, that maybe at one point you were really competent, but you sort of let it go. You stopped reading, you stopped trying, you, you got a little bit, you know, let's just say lazy or, um, you know, complacent about your skill set. So that can happen too. Yeah, it seems that, um the scare always is when somebody somebody goes and sees you you know if i were to come and see you uh, i'd say holly give me my peak performance i really want to be even better than i am now you know i've been practicing law for 27 years you know and i just want to be better and what it's the scare is is that you make me this robot monster and then i have even less time you know with my private life you know and that does your therapy involve any harmony between you know your private downtime versus your performance? You bet. And, and part of that is because of this, right? Because there's only two ways you quote unquote create time. Like you can't actually create time, right? You can get more efficient, which is what we work on, or you can eliminate. It's kind of all you have. I mean, we all have the same 24 hours. It's the one great equalizer. I mean, of course, if you have a ton of money, you can have somebody who drives you everywhere and cooks and cleans and does all that stuff. So there's a little bit of a hedge there, but generally, well, that's delegation, right? That's elimination. How do I eliminate or delegate that? So the point is actually to your point is when you get better at 
at the efficiency part, you have more time to spend with your family or more time for your private life. And you don't have that anxiety of, oh my God, I have so many things to do. I can't even enjoy myself because I'm so freaked out or nervous or thinking about this long list of things I really should be doing, even though I'm sitting here with my family. So when you're working, you're thinking, oh, I'm not with my family. And when you're with your family, you're thinking, oh God, I should be working. So it actually does both. Sounds like me, but go ahead. I almost wrote a song once called Whatever I'm Doing, I Feel Like I Should Be Doing Something Else. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like me too. Okay. <laughs> so so when we're talking about uh, people that uh, come in and get some benefit from you, I, when I was thinking about this question in, pre in preparation for today, I was thinking that you know your job isn't that different from mine to the extent that I've got people coming in that need my help, right? And I have the tools, and I've got the keys to success if they would just listen to me, right? You know, and some people do, some people don't. Some people are really succeed, you know, in, in getting through their family law matters in good shape. Others, you know, we have to part ways sometimes because they're just dropping out or they don't want to hear my advice. So do you have sometimes a mixture of people that are able to follow your instruction versus uh, that can't? And can you speak a little bit about uh, the type of person that succeeds and the type of person that fails at trying to gain that peak performance? Yeah, and I think it's, it's kind of similar to all the different parts of therapy, you know, what, what makes it work or not work. They're, they're pretty similar, um, you know, dynamics. One is, are you willing to do what you need to do? And I think what you're bringing up is what we call taking influence and in the therapy world is, you know, do you take influence from your partner, from your therapist? Do you, do you actually use the tools? So people will say, well, how, you know, how much better am I going to get or how fast? And it's like, well, it depends on a ton of things, right? Your temperament, your genome, your, your uh, trauma history. But I think the biggest predictor is, are you willing to do the hard work? And you know, a lot of people are not. And again, like I said, they we're kind of trained these days. There's, oh, there's like this secret hack. There's this like, you know, this magic pill that you're going to take and all your problems are going to go away. And so part of it is just accepting that. So for example, with couples, one of the things we know from research is 69% of your problems are what we call perpetual problems. You are not going to get rid of them. You're not going to solve it. It's not going to magically go away. You're going to have to learn how to manage it. How are you going to manage that issue, that problem? Because it's not going to go away. And, and sometimes, again, we think uh, the disposable society, oh, I'll just toss that one away. I'll throw it away and get a new one, just like we do with a toaster. And you get another person. And guess what? You're going to have 69% of your problems with that person that are what we call perpetual problems. So the good news is that there are some things we can solve. And I'm all about it. If you can solve it, I'm seriously, I'm super solution focused. But Part of that is accepting that that person, whether it be your therapist or your friend or your child or your partner or, your, you know, a colleague, you're going to have some things in that relationship that you don't like or you don't agree with or rub you the wrong way. And so how do you go about managing that, maybe decreasing it in frequency or intensity or duration, but you have to accept the hard work. So some people come in and they just sort of want to do that or... I have some people, especially like in couples therapy, they come in and they play this game of, I'm the bigger victim, they're a terrible person. And the other person goes, no, 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 I'm the bigger victim, you're the most terrible person. And they just go back and forth, which is really what they want is somebody to be a referee. That's not my job. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. I'm not there. I don't, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't see into the, but how are you going to change the, the communication dynamic? That's a whole different issue, right? Because a lot of times what happens is both people can be right. Right. Yeah, that's right. You talk about doing the hard work. So I, what does that look like? I mean, if you're giving some, you know, help to somebody that's coming in and wants to, uh, it, enhance their performance, for lack of a better term, you know, they want to, you know, uh, be better at what they do. It sounds to me like you, they're leaving your sessions with some ideas as the things they should work on. Oh, sure. Yeah, do I'm you, big on that. Do you give them specific tasks or do you let them come up with the ideas or how does that work? Well, I have a whole bunch of stuff. That's probably my biggest, strongest suit that I'm always thinking, okay, let's try this. And if it doesn't work, fine. I got a thousand others. Try something else. Let's try something else. And of course, if they come up with it, it's even better, right? But most people, 
if they could, they wouldn't be sitting in my office. Um, but yeah, sometimes just brainstorming and something will come up, fantastic. So here's part of the work, right? We say, what is the work? Here's one. So you're, you're in, a, in a really terrible emotional state Maybe you haven't gotten enough sleep, you're tired, you're hungry, you, you've had all this resentment that's built up and you and your partner get in a huge fight. And what we're talking about is you slow down and you say, I'm not going to yell or scream. I refuse to do it. I'm not going to yell or scream or call you names. I'm going to learn to be more graceful, more kind, more open, more forgiving. And I'm going to listen to you before I start butting in, telling you you're wrong, raising my voice at you. Um, and it's hard when you're mad, when you really feel like you're right, you go, we, I call it, that's the, the, called the one up position. I am right and you are wrong. I know better, I'm smarter, I'm more organized, I'm better than you and you're so mad and you wanna do this kind of metaphorically to your partner to really calm down and say, this is the person I love. I love this person, I don't wanna treat them that way. Maybe in your anger, you get convinced by that little voice that you wanna, you know, well, you're right but that's really not gonna get you anywhere. So in that moment, learning that self-control and learning how to work through things instead of you know, sort of bullying your way through it, for example, or another example would be cutting off, that not saying anything. And, you, and that person has to learn how to you know, be more graceful and kind and say, hey, you know, I'm gonna sit and at least listen to you and you know, try really hard to work this out. Do you see yourself as uh, being uh, someone that holds people accountable? So they come back after you've given them kind of like these things to work on, and then you say, well, how's it going? And is that part of the, the process of getting people to be better? Oh, sure. There's just nothing like, and I, you know, with, with music lessons or therapy or whatever, having some regular thing. Like if you're going to go do physical therapy, you need it to be regular. Like that really helps. You know, do you have somebody that you're saying, okay, you know, did you do that thing you were going to do? Did you work on that or not? It's really important. Like ask anybody who's a musician, if you don't have somebody, like if you don't have a regular writing partner, or you don't have a teacher that you're meeting with on the regular, do you practice more or less? The answer is always less. I, I noticed, I noticed from uh, looking at your website and some other materials that I, I have on my research of you that you are a musician and you've done art therapy and you've described your work as not necessarily a science, but it's more of a mix of science and, and an art. Can you speak of that? What, what does that mean? Sure. Well, it's interesting, you know, we say kind of right brain, left brain is sort of the parlance. I mean, some of that's being disputed in the neuro neuroscience world, but so you think about sort of a research psychologist who is um, very analytical, almost like accountants like, and they don't have that sort of warmth and connection and, and thinking on their feet and creativity um, that you need to be a good therapist. On the other hand, you have a lot of therapists, I don't know if I should really say that, but it's true, who are just the sweetest, kindest people. Really therapists are just the salt of the earth, sweet, kind, loving people, and they mean well but there's no science behind it. You know, what's the actual research behind that? You know, have you actually looked it up? Have you read anything? Have you, do you, you know, have you looked into it? Um, are you even collecting, you know, clinical data um, about, you know, what works or what doesn't? Are you giving them tools and suggestions? Um, because that's a lot more left brain and keeping track of where are they? You know, what have they worked on, you know, this week we did this, 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 this. Like I have all kinds of different ways. I have charts and all these different things that I keep track of for them. So it's, I think it's halfway between an art and a science. If you're really in the art side and you don't have any science, I don't think you're all that effective. But if you're, I mean, in some ways you can because the connection really is sweet. It's very like a, like a warm blankie, you know? But if you're all science, and you're, you don't have that art or that connection or that warmth, then it just feels like you're going into a robot. So I don't think that works either. Yeah, again, very similar to my profession. I mean, you could have all the legal knowledge in the world, but if you can't relate to people or persuade people, then you're kind of half doing your job. And on the other hand, if all you could do is argue really well and you don't understand the law or the procedure, then you're going to be ineffective as well. Yeah, I, I get that. I always say that attorneys, bartenders, and hairdressers are actually therapists too. <laughs> I mean, you have to be part therapist to be a good attorney, especially in family law, because all the emotions and betrayals and oh, so hard. 
Yeah, in some respects, I wish that I had more training in psychology because we spend a lot of time listening to people and trying to get them to move forward. You know, and if I had somebody like you sitting in the chair next to me, we could, uh, you know, get through processes a lot better probably. But, uh, you know, I, I'm a real big believer in sending people to get uh, therapy. And, you know, with couples, you know, when, they, when I get a call from somebody that says, I, I don't know if I want a divorce, uh, but things have been really bad. You know, past 10 years have been bad. We're sleeping in separate rooms. We're hanging on there, you know, and I, I never, ever uh, move forward with the divorce. I'm like, you go think about it. You go see a therapy. You do everything. A therapist, you do everything that you can, you know, to try to uh, determine what's best for you, you know, and stuff. Yeah. So you probably get a, uh, a lot of people that come in as a put on your other hat, the marriage family therapist hat, you probably get uh, folks that are in that state of being when they come to see you. Yeah, yeah the research shows, depending on who you read, that people, couples come to therapy, especially couples, are around somewhere between four to seven years. Usually people say seven years after the point where you really should have gone. Oh. You know, you just let it go and let it go. I call it, what I call it is the long, slow build. All these things that you say, oh, I really don't feel like it, or I'll do that tomorrow, or you got to pick your battles, or now's not a good time, or I don't want to tangle with them, or I don't want to deal with their reaction, um, and, and all those things that build up, now you have all this psychological tension between you. So a lot of times even you can't remember what happened five, six years ago that led to part of that, but that psychological tension is there and can be set off like, like that. And of course, people have different reactions. It can be an explosion, it, you know, because you can repress, deny, or avoid it, but it doesn't go. It doesn't go away. It leaks out. It can be anger explosions. It can be stonewalling or cut off. Somebody just ignores you or doesn't really talk to you or doesn't connect. It can be uh, passive aggressiveness or what I call emotional steaming, like a cartoon character that stinks, and we, they have those little like green things that come off, and you know they smell. Um, people do that emotionally. They're, like, I didn't say anything. So you didn't have to. Your body language, your tone of your voice, you're steaming it off. Or, of course, you can manifest it in your body. We have lots of studies on, you know, you're setting yourself up for heart disease and Alzheimer's and all the bad stuff we don't want if you don't have good emotional regulation. So by the time they come in, they have all these bad habits that I just described. They have all these resentments. They're doing the, they're a terrible person. I'm the biggest victim dance. They just want to, you know, prove that they're right. What they really want when they come in, this is the truth. What you really want is for the therapist to look at you and go, oh my gosh, I don't know how you've, you've done this. How can you stand them? They're actually really terrible. But on the other, it's like the, the devil and the angel. The other side is like, but I want to be married and I don't really want to get a divorce, right? So there's this kind of struggle with all of that that goes on. So, oh yeah, people come to get divorced or they're coming to figure out, you know, do I, but they'll show you that, you know, they, when you're trained as a young therapist, like I do a panel every year to grad school and it's like, you know, you're going to have that people who come in and they're really that one person's got one foot out the door or they're already having an affair. Um, so how interesting. Yeah. Okay. So this is the first time I've ever spoken to uh, somebody like this because now on my end, they're coming to see me. And as you can imagine, I don't see too many success stories, right? It's always therapy didn't work. Um, I wish I could see the successful ones, you know, and stuff. But hearing what you're saying about one foot out the door, I see that a lot of times when they come back and say, you know, um, I'm going there just because they want me to, but I've already made up my mind or you know, when I, when I got him into therapy, he just wanted to deny and he walked out, you know, and, you know, and there's various, uh, uh, you know, scenarios that I'm sure that you see all the time. Um, so w when these people are in there and they're talking about, you know, the problems that they're having in the relationship, and you mentioned something before and that they want a referee a lot of times, you know, and, and, and so my, my feeling about the perfect therapy setting is is when people are both willing to work and and try to make it work you know and the other thing is is that therapy seems to be a safe place to speak you know sort of because you're not in the confines of your home anymore where you could take out the you know the knives and say all the nasty things you're basically in the presence of a you know a third party and there's some 
decorum that's there. I, can you speak about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually would argue that you should have the same decorum with each other um, as you do when you're in the therapist's office. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, that we actually give, we give more respect sometimes to a stranger in line at the grocery store than we do our partners. People, you know, like I'm saying, they lose their boundaries or yelling and screaming or whatever. And I you do- You want to see that in therapy, Holly? You want these people in there kind of arguing the way they do at home? No, I want them to give their partner the same respect they would give a stranger. Oh, okay. I, I want them to up their game. I don't allow it. I don't allow it. Like, you know what? You've been doing this at home for how, whatever, 10, 15, 20 years, and it's not working, which is why right. you're sitting here. So let's try something different because that's not going to work for you. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you had a friend or a boss who yelled and screamed at you and told you how terrible you were every day, would you want to go to work? No. Of course not. You know, so um we need to learn to treat each other better and that's part of it too it's not about the referee cats jumping up it's not about the referee it's about you how are you going to change what's your part in it right that's part of the work too is people, really what they want is to come in and have the therapist say oh my gosh you know they really need to change they want the secret hope is that they're going to get the other person to change and of course i mean sure you want them to make some adjustments, but if you're not willing to move the needle, then it's not going to, it's probably not going to work. So during the past 12 months, uh -huh. um, has business been gone up or down for you? My business has always been incredibly stable. Okay. I'm so lucky. I don't know what happens. It's, you know, people graduate and like people come in. It's, it's just, Interesting, but have you done more? I assume that you've done virtual therapy before COVID. So yeah, uh, yeah, because I have people in different parts of the world. So yeah, that's kind of cool for your occupation, though. You're t you don't have any boundaries as far as geographical boundaries. You you could talk to somebody in New York City or you know Bangladesh. You know, well, as a therapist, cool. I can only practice in California. Oh, it's okay. It's the it's the coaching people who I have in you know all these different countries. It's really interesting. It'll be like you know what's going on in Shanghai or what's happening in Italy. I get kind of these stories. It's really interesting. But so so you have um, clients that are virtually around the world for your peak performance, and that must be fascinating i would think uh talking to people that have real life issues that we have here right here in california oh yeah and you know what is it like fitting in the the different culture and you know how are they managing you know business and all that different stuff it's it's really interesting kind of hearing what's going on because i was hearing stuff out of china um you know when the pandemic started and just interesting things that come up and how, how have these people found you? I mean, you've got clients in China. How, how in the world did you get connected to that? They either hear about me or they, um, you know, have met me in California and then they moved. Okay. Do you think the quality of your work is uh, changed or different remotely than, you know, coming in and seeing you? It's an interesting question because people ask me that. I, I think remote therapy is great. I love it myself. For, my, for me, like, I, I just like it it's so efficient. You know, you just throw up your camera, you have your session, you're done. It's nice. I like it. I get a lot less cancellations. People are more consistent. It's wow. interesting too, seeing where they live, like seeing their environment um, sometimes has clues. Are they messy or are they neat and tidy? Um, even seeing some couples where, you know, everybody has their spot, right? Their little Zoom spots. But I have some couples that they're they're on their bed and talking. It's just so it's amazing kind of watching them in their environment. And I like it. Some people even do phone because they want to move around, you know, that you're on Zoom all day. And um, in, in my old office, I had two treadmills. Even we could walk during session because <laughs> it's so good for your blood flow when we sit okay. too much. And, yeah. you know, when you're walking, you're talking. Like how many times have you been on a hike and you start talking about things. So it's kind of, I think it's nice to move too. So but whatever works for different people. Yeah. We, we lawyers are starting to really love the remote access as well to both, you know, talking to clients in the court, especially. So I get that. Um, but I just want to throw in a funny, hopefully your uh, clients aren't speaking to you on two separate phones, walking on different treadmills or, or something. That, that could be a chaotic thing. I would think if it's 
uh, co co therapy. On the treadmill when they're on the phone. No, that used to be in the office. But yeah, people, you know, walking and talking are funny. <laughs> No, that, that's interesting. So, you know, I always wondered, like, you know, when, when people come to see you in person, you know, multiple times, let's say that there's a couple that's coming in there. Do you always take note as to how they're sitting, who's sitting closest to you, or does that mean anything to you? Well, it depends, but sure. Oh, yeah. There's, there's a whole lot of somatic work that's really interesting. And when I was younger, kind of being more scientifically minded, I used to go... Oh, that, that's like so foofy, but oh, it's, I had to eat my words on that one. It is, it's really hip stuff. Um, oh yeah. So, you know, you watch couples who, for example, aren't having sex and they're sitting way on the other side of the sofa, not touching, not turning toward each other. Oh, sure. Versus couples who sit next to each other and are touching and. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Well, I, we've been at it for a long here. Let me look at my other questions. This is my chance to really get you here. Let's see. Uh, so I want to give you a hypothetical. Okay. Let, let's say that we've got a, uh, a single mom. She's divorced, right? And she's having problems co-parenting with uh, the father of her child. She comes to you uh, and wants to be a better co-parent. So to start off with, are you going to be worried at all that the other party may not be of the same mindset? Absolutely, positively, without question. Even in a couple who's married, you know, parenting is a, it's a big issue for couples. So the first thing I would say is why not both of you come in and do it together? I've had those cases where they can't be in the same room. They're nasty with each other, resentful with each other. And so once a week they come and they work out stuff. So the kids don't split them. We call it splitting is what we get like, oh, mom said, or dad said, or they get what they want. And then they're playing, you know, I, I'm not going to have any boundaries with my child because I just want to give them everything and spoil them. But that's not good for kids. It's just not. We need good functional limits and boundaries. But if you're the parent who's actually holding the boundary, they don't like you as much. It's a bad cycle sometimes with co-parenting. So usually what my first thing would be, would the other person be willing to come in and do it together? So you are on the same page or we can work it out in a more neutral you know, territory. Like you were saying, when you have a third person, oftentimes people are a little bit more, you know, better behaved than they are. Um, but let's assume that, the that, that there's, that's not realistic. I mean, this client of yours is, uh, was married to a real jerk. You know, somebody that uh, it's his way or the highway. Uh, is there any benefit from this person still coming to, to see you? Yeah. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, first of all, parenting is really tough. It's just hard. I don't care who you are. And part of it is because you have all this influence of culture. And their friends and, you know, the internet and social media. So they're like some of it, you don't really have that much control over, but sure. I mean, how are you going to, it, it, and some of those relationship skills we were talking about earlier, go with your kids too. I mean, how do you learn how to communicate better? How do you learn about relationship skills? How do you learn how to hold a boundary? How do you learn how to regulate when you're uncomfortable, you're watching your child and they're upset with you. And it breaks your heart and you, oh gosh, you know, you don't want to, but you know, you have to as a parent or yeah. How do you, how do you handle your anger at the other parents? You know, so Holly, wrapping this up, you seem to me to be like extremely stable, well-adjusted, you know, you're not, uh, uh, you don't have, you know, any signs of distress on you, but you're dealing with people's problems. And it's very similar to a family law attorney. I always tell people that come to my office that, that work with me, you know, my associate attorneys, you're not going to make it here if you take your work home with you, you know, and you stress. What do you do to be able to cope with, you know, all the problems that you see on a daily basis? That's an excellent question, because one of the things we know is that therapists sometimes, if you look at their brain scans, they have brain scans similar to a combat veteran that we call it secondary trauma. So there's a few ways I do it. And again, like I'm using all the skills I'm teaching people and I've because I went to therapy and you get, you get the, what I call, uh-huh, hmm, how do you feel about that? You get that for an hour with like, you know, five minute silences in between and you're like, okay, what do I do about it? So that's, you know, partly me digging and saying, okay, I'm going to put together a plan that works for me. So one of the things I do is I do 
three really, really long client days where I see all my clients, I do them in a block because I'm in the zone. I'm set up, I'm in the zone, I'm in the mindset. And it's easier for me to go another, you know, three or four sessions in those days than for me to have other days. It's, it's also an efficiency thing. It's called um, batching. So you batch all your like activities together. So then I have an accounting batch and I have a paperwork batch and I have a, you know, research and treatment planning batch, but I do all those hours um, in, in blocks. So I have other days that I don't have to be in that emotional space. That's helped me a lot. I used to do like a little bit, six days a week, uh, it's just too much. Um, the other thing I would say is you got to exercise. You have to exercise. You, you need to, and not a ton time. You don't be hard on your body. It's not like you have to, you know, go to the gym. How, how and much exercise do person. people need in your view in order to keep their mental health? Here's an interesting, uh, well, here's my first opinion about that is it's better to do a little bit each day than to have a couple big workouts a week. Um, and so again, about efficiency, I'll go back to that because here are a couple of things. One, the best workout in the whole world is the one that you'll do. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> so that's one. The second one is the best thing you can do for your fitness is don't get injured. That's a Hollyism for you. I got a lot of those too. <laughs> so for me, I have, I know exactly, I have it automated. I get up, I, you know, I feed my pets. I, you know, get on my clothes. I walk my dog, then we run. And then we come home, then I do a little bit of weightlifting, and then I take a shower ready for my day. I do it every, almost every day. It's the routine um, that you keep. Yeah. So I, you know, I know I get up, get, you know, pets, get dressed. We walk a little to warm up. Then we run, we come home, do a little weightlifting, shower, ready, done, easy. So I don't have to get my clothes and gather my gym bag and get all the extra stuff and find everything and then drive to the gym and park and then go in and check in and then go to the bathroom and then finally work out and then, you know, come home and, you know, drive home and all that other stuff. And then you have to, you know, do all the extra laundry from that or whatever. It's just too much. It's not efficient. I'd rather spend that time working out than driving and parking and doing and whatever. So, and, you know, and you're going to come out financially ahead anyway, if you just buy good gym equipment. So I have, I have a lot of good gym equipment in my house. In fact, I have one of those mirrors, you know, the mirror thing. And I do personal training through the mirror. Oh my gosh. Wow. In my, in my house. It's really easy. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, Holly, I can't thank you enough. This was really a, a good uh, show. I mean, I, I think that anybody who's going to be listening to this is going to gain a lot. I mean, you've, you've, Give it a little bit to a lot of people, you know, and, and stuff. So cool. Can, can we uh, invite you to come on another time? I'd love cool. to. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>